Gunagoa Sewagwego, Wat Kwanu Peace and greetings to all of you and welcome. Gunjokwa Sewadamusio Skanikari Wesa, Te Chidawanu Hurado, Ne Sungwayat Diso, Ne Wahi Rosa Anyo, Ne Gadi, Ne Ohandugari Wadekwa, Ungawana Hetsdu, Ona Sewadamusio, Gunjokwa Ne Egadi, Ohandugari Wadekwa, Ungadi Wanungode. Please lend me your ears for a few minutes as we gather our minds together to offer the words that come before all others and offer our greetings and thanks to the Creator and all things in the natural world, as I've been taught to do and as is the custom of my people, the Haudenosaunee. This is what we've been instructed to do before any business shall come to pass where two or more people have gathered. I'm very, very happy to see more than two people here. <laughs> Aguego unska, andido at wait nuni, ne unguat ni gura, dano de atinurado, ne aguego yunki enoase, geo and jade. We gather our minds together and offer our greetings and thanks to all the things on the earth. All the green and growing things, the medicines, the foods, the plants and trees, the shrubs and grasses, the waters and the life within the waters, and to our relatives, the animals. Aguego unska, and did what wait nuni, ne unguat ni gura, dano de atinuverado, ne aguego yunki enoase, jeet carunyade. We gather our minds together and offer our greetings and thanks to all the things in the sky the birds who sing their beautiful songs, the winds that come from the four directions, our elder brother the sun, our grandmother the moon, our grandfathers the thunders, and the stars in the heavens. Dano onagadi, aguego, de chidwenu horado, ne sunguadiso. And finally, we offer our choicest greetings and thanks to Sungwayat Dison, the creator of all things. To Niodunhak Nezewa Nigora. And so now the ceremony to begin and the words that come before all others have been said. And we can all focus on the reason that we've come together today. At this time, it's normally my practice to advise that if any of you are Carrying any burdens or you're challenged in any way, I invite you to leave those things at the door while we spend our time together tonight. You may choose to pick them up on your way out, <laughs> but I, I encourage you to leave them there for Creator to take care of. We acknowledge and thank our ancestors for continuing to live in a way that ensures we, rem we remember our agreements and responsibilities. Wat kwanu horadu, kanu shuni yungyats, Garakwine Catherine Brandt Gunha Yun Dajets Ne Agate Nistuha Donald Lennox Hill Gunha Rumayats Ne Ragate Niha Waganyatu Ganyun Kehaga Ni Wagun Hoju Gundege Nidwagenu Gundege Gunagari Gano Shuni, she is making a house, is what they call me. My deceased mother was Catherine Brandt and my deceased father was Lennox Hill. He was Wolf Clan, I'm Turtle Clan. I'm from the Mohawk Nation. I come from Gundege, and that is where I live. In a more formal introduction, I'd continue on to tell you about my family, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and so on. That could take a long time. <laughs> so for today, I will just say that both of my parents and all of my grandparents, at least six generations back, are Ganyunkehaga. I can trace my ancestry back to 1784, when my people, the Mohawks of Fort Hunter, from the Mohawk Valley in Upper New York State, arrived at our resettlement at the Bay of Quinte in Ontario. It's customary and respectful that before I address a group, I place myself in relation to who I am within my family, my clan, and my nation. It's important that I position myself so that you know where I am speaking from, what informs me, and where I am in relation to you and this land that we all stand on today. It's important to pay respect to ancestral and traditional territories and local indigenous communities. By doing so, we honor our Indigenous ancestors and the current stewards of the land and speak to our personal, spiritual, political, and social relationships with the land and with each other. I'm also the Associate Vice Principal Indigenous Initiatives and Reconciliation at Queen's University. It's my responsibility to work towards and to encourage further work on decolonization, indigenization, and reconciliation across our campuses. This event tonight, contributes to encouraging greater awareness and understanding of Indigenous pedagogies and ways of seeing.
I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to Queens and most especially to the Isabel and this wonderful opportunity for an in-person celebration after many year, many months of none <laughs> and a time of sharing and learning together and seeing the night sky from a new perspective with new eyes. I applaud the artists that will be sharing with us this evening and the speakers and everyone who has put together an amazing evening for our enjoyment. The Office of Indigenous Initiatives is thrilled to partner with the McDonald Institute to bring this experience to us. Nyawak Giwahi, I thank you for your kind attention. Hi, am I good? Hi, everyone, and thank you very much, Jan, for that lovely welcome to this evening and to this place. I'm Mark Richardson. I'm the Education and Outreach Officer of the Arthur B. McDonald Canadian National Particle Physics Research Institute, a community of scientists across Canada uncovering some of the biggest mysteries of the universe by studying some of its smallest parts. I'm always finding new opportunities to bring science and the public together, and in particular, finding new ways to think about and with science. Now for me, home is here on the Kataraqui, now Kingston, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples, and many indigenous peoples before them. I appreciate that we're all able to learn tonight on and from these lands. Now my settler ancestors from Scotland and France came to Turtle Island through colonialism, and I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the traditional Eskikawakik lands. In reflecting on the calls to, the action, calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Report, I recognize the role of my ancestors in removing the stewards of this land. And as an astronomer, someone who revels in the wonder of the land, the world, the skies, and the universe, I recognize that this science relies on facilities that use traditional and sacred lands of various indigenous peoples who have a voice to add to this science. Now to all of you, I urge you to think of the connection that each of you have with the land around you and the gift that we have to learn wherever we are, including the access to dark skies above us, which are actually made quite a lot better right now as we uh, approach a new, a new moon that will be at the end of the week. And I actually encourage you after tonight's event to explore online resources or other resources. We have the library here with a number of resources, but there's also ones online like whose.land and nativeland.ca. And through those resources, maybe you can learn about the past peoples who have lived where you live. Moving forward, let's reflect and work towards the decolonization of these spaces to make them ones of friendship, love, and access for all those in our community. So again, I am so thrilled that you're able to join us tonight. This really is my first real in-person event in 25 months, like Jen highlighted, it has been months. And for somebody whose education and outreach um, is in the title of their job, this is what I live for, so it's been a long 25 months. I am looking forward to tonight's program. I, I love dance, I love culture and stories and conversation, and tonight's gonna bring you all of those things. So tonight we're gonna begin with Red Sky Performance's Trace which uh, incorporates Anishinaabe sky star and creation stories. And then I will welcome to the stage two astronomers to lead us on a discussion of Eduaptamunk, that is two-eyed seeing, uh, in the context of astronomy. But first, I would like to welcome Tony Noble. He's the scientific director at the McDonald Institute. Just to say a, a couple more words before we begin. Thanks, Mark, and hi, everybody, and welcome to this event. So my name is Tony Noble, and I'm the scientific director for what uh, Mark called the Arthur B. McDonald Canadian Astroparticle Physics Research Institute, which is quite a mouthful. And so as you heard from Jan, we usually call this the McDonald Institute, but I want to focus just on the astroparticle physics part. So you may be asking, you know, how are these things related? We're having a cultural and artistic event tonight, uh, sponsored in part by astroparticle physics. So the idea actually started for me, uh, it's probably over a year now, when I was listening to CBC radio, 
and there was a segment on there on CBC's Unreserved, which featured the executive and artistic director of the performance, the Red Sky performance, uh, Sandra Laurent, who I believe is here somewhere today. Um, and in that, she was speaking of the, the performance but all, and the star stories that the, the performance incorporates, but speaking also to how surprising it is that we teach our children stories, myths from Roman and Greek uh, uh, mythology, and yet uh, we, we have the opportunity right here to, to present the indigenous uh, perspective as well. And why, why aren't we doing that? And it, it's a sort of penny that sunk with me right at that moment that, yeah, why aren't we? We're at the right latitude, we're, the, the seasons match, every, this is our place. And so I was uh, really, I guess, inspired by that thought and uh, reached out to the Office of Indigenous Initiatives and, and, and that's where the ball started. So I'm, I'm really delighted we were able to put this together tonight. Um, at the McDonald Institute, we were focused, as Mark said, on a couple of things, but really we're trying to understand the history of the universe and all the particles that go into making up that universe. That's what astroparticle physics is about. But the way we advance the science is by building the connections across the country. We are an institute that has people from all the way to Vancouver and all across the country where we brought them all together to, to to, to work on this problem. And the way we do that is by bringing together a community with very diverse points of view. And so um, I think what you'll see tonight is, is an example of that in bringing the, these communities together. So I, I'm delighted that tonight, and I'll be like the others, as I say here, to you know, now that we're beginning perhaps to escape from the clutches of COVID, we actually have the opportunity to get together uh, for what I think you'll find is a fantastic art artistic but also thought-provoking uh, performance and uh, uh, stay for the conversation that follows afterwards and so uh, with without any further ado uh, I think we should start so thank you so to continue the work tonight of bringing western and indigenous astronomy together and um, yeah I would like to introduce uh, two astronomers that will be joining us this evening um, and so I'd like to begin by welcoming up uh, Melanie Demers so Melanie is an environmental and social analyst at Two Worlds Consulting. She is Ganyakaha, sorry, uh, Ganyakaha from Six Nations and was raised outside of her community in Aymar, Quebec. She holds a uh, Master's of Science in Astrophysics and has worked as both a former Indigenous astronomy professor and an astrophysical research assistant in a Western, sci and, sorry, a Western scientific context. Her experience in the Indigenous education sector includes course facilitation, meeting facilitation, and program coordination. Melanie is, a pas is passionate about the application of two-eyed seeing in Indigenous education and research, and she values community, collaboration, kindness, and lifelong learning. So let's welcome Melanie. Mm -hmm. Next, I would like to welcome Dave Haynes. Dave is a professor emeritus in the Department of Physics, Engineering Physics, and Astronomy at Queen's University, who continues to teach astronomy to large undergraduate classes. It is an activity that he really enjoys, and he is making efforts to bring indigenous ways of knowing into these classes. Dave got his master's and PhD in astronomy at the University of Toronto in 1975 and held research positions at Cambridge and at the Anglo-Australian Observatory until moving to Queens in 1984. His research is on using galaxies to understand the size and the age of the universe. So please welcome, please join us, Dave. <laughs> Now, before I turn it over, my understanding is that Melanie and Dave tonight are hoping that you guys engage with this, this part of the evening. Um, and so I actually have two helpers in the crowd with me today. Um, we have Alex and Zach, and they will, be, uh, they will have mics so that they can help facilitate communication between the crowd and Melanie and Dave. And also, we have just started an online stream, and so people might be joining in online as well who are unable to join today. And they can post comments or questions there, and Alex, I think, is gonna use a bit of technology to help facilitate even questions from them. Um, yeah, and that's, that's enough of a pro to me. And so, uh, Melanie and Dave, please take it away. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, say go, say go, go. Melanie Niwaksanoda, Dachnu Ganyangehaga Niwagun Wanjoda. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Melanie, um, and I'm Mohawk. My family thinks that we are the Turtle Clan, um, but we grew up outside of our community in Elmer, Quebec. So I am French um, on my dad's side, hence my Demers last name. Um, and today I'm going to be kind of sharing my research and learnings um, from a variety of mentors that I've had in Indigenous astronomy, specifically Haudenosaunee astronomy. Um, and some of those mentors um, include Sasha Dockstader, who I, I co-taught alongside um, in an Indigenous astronomy course at Six Nations Polytechnic, Dehaganere Henhawk, um, who was my teacher for the Ganyageha or Mohawk language, as well as Kisa Montour Parker, who was our teaching assistant and fluent in Gayakono or Cayuga um, or Ganyageha and Mohawk. So that's kind of where I'm coming to you from today. Um, and this whole discussion is really about two-eyed seeing. So I've actually been in Dave's seat before. Um, I was the Western eye in the, taught that I, in the course that I taught. Um, but today I'll be sharing as much as I can from the Haudenosaunee eye. And so when we think about two-eyed seeing, we're really thinking about um, a gift of multiple perspectives. And this was one of the definitions for two-eyed seeing by um, Elder Albert Marshall, who's Mi'kmaq. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that today. Um, and you can consider us being kind of one eye each. Um, <laughs> so hopefully that's a good way of looking at it for you. Um, and what we're going to do is actually just talk a little bit first about the indigenous eye, because I think for some of us, maybe um, it might be the first time that we're thinking about indigenous knowledge and we need to understand what that's all about to understand Indigenous astronomy. So you can see here, I just prepared a word cloud um, with some of the writings that I've seen about what Indigenous astronomy is all about. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of interesting words there that you might not expect. Um, there's holistic, there's interconnected, there's elders, there's generations, there's narrative, there's story. Um, and all of these things are really important to consider when you're talking about this holistic knowledge framework, which is land-based and it is place-based. So all of these things are important to keep in mind when we're thinking about indigenous astronomy and more specifically Haudenosaunee astronomy as I'll present today. Um, so you can keep this diagram in the back of your mind. I also want to talk about how indigenous knowledge interacts with Western knowledge. And that's really how this event came to be. This is an example of it. Um, so when we talk about the two row wampum, which you can see right here, um, there's one stream on the left-hand side and another stream on the right-hand side. And this represents um, a treaty with the Haudenosaunee in one stream and the Dutch in another stream. So when you think about this two row wampum, um, there was a, sh a canoe on one side and a ship on the other. And so these two ways of life coexisted, um, but they were separate. They were not meant to interfere. And so this is one way of looking at these two knowledge systems where um, they, they exist separately, but they don't kind of intermingle. And I've heard teachings actually where if you try to put one foot in the ship and one foot in the canoe, you lose your balance. Or if you try to go from the canoe to the ship or the ship to the canoe, you can actually get lost in the water. So we have to be careful about how these two knowledge systems interact. Um, and we're here to talk about that in a good way. And so we don't want to compare. We don't want to use one to validate the other. We want to consider them as two separate perspectives. And so you can see here on this um, diagram, this would be a painting that represents two-eyed seeing. So when we're thinking about how it interacts in this case, um, according to Elder Albert Marshall, who's Mi'kmaq, um, you have one eye that sees through one way of knowing, and you have another eye that sees through another way of knowing. And today, uh, we're talking about two-eyed seeing, but of course, we just had a third representation um, with the lovely performance that we just watched, which is, you could say, three-eyed seeing. So. We have this additional eye as well that we can consider with you know, interpreting um, indigenous perspectives of the sky 
through motion. So there's lots of different perspectives that we can take, but this is just an example of how to hold these two knowledge systems together, um, but do so in a good way. And then lastly, you might recognize this um, symbol, which is a medicine wheel. And this is not traditionally Haudenosaunee. Um, this is from typically Western Canada, so in Alberta and the Plains. Um, but it's a good example of how there's a third way of looking at this, where if you consider indigenous knowledge to be holistic, you have spiritual components, emotional components, um, physical components, as well as intellectual components. So all of these things are important in that knowledge system. And if you look at it as kind of a whole circle, you can actually fit Western science inside of that pie, inside of that slice of pie. So right here, if we just look at this little um, quadrant, that would be the intellectual component. So when we're talking about sometimes a reductionistic approach to science, that's what we're talking about for Western knowledge. So if you look at it this way, it actually fits within this framework of indigenous knowledge. Um, and since elders are much, much smarter than me, I wanted to also put a quote by Rick Hill, which you can see here um, in the slide. And basically Rick Hill um, considers indigenous knowledge to be deriving its understandings from the earth. So really it's taking its learnings from the earth and that's where the knowledge comes from. And every culture in the world technically has an indigenous knowledge system depending on place, so where those people live um, and the land where they live. So this is another important aspect of, it, of the whole thing. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention that Haudenosaunee oral history, so oftentimes when knowledge was passed down, it was done so through storytelling. And that can be seen to be dated in um, Western papers as far back as 1142 AD, um, based on the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So it's a very old way of passing down knowledge, and I wanted to emphasize that. Um, and so storytelling is another important aspect of what we'll be doing here today. So are there any questions from the audience before I pass it over to Dave? Seeing none. <coughs> <laughs> All right. I, could, if you could advance the slide. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for that kind introduction, uh, Mark. And uh, I noted that uh, Melanie began with a, a comment on her personal background. I'd like to just add one of my own if I could. And that is that I've been uh, very pleased to be associated with Queens for a very long time. It's only in recent years that I've started to be, to incorporate indigenous aspects into my astronomical teaching. And that was inspired in two ways. First of all, by the fact that Queens itself is motivated in that direction. And uh, th we've, he we've heard about that in the introductory remarks tonight. But secondly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, influence of my daughter, Amy, who was uh, a student here at Queens and went through the ATEP, the Aboriginal Teachers Ed Program in the, in the Bachelor of Education. And Amy's been a great uh, inspiration for me in this as well. So um, I don't think I need to say to this audience that this is not a debate. We're not debating the merits of the different perspectives <laughs> in astronomy. We are here to talk about the, the two-eyed, the two different perspectives, and to see what we learn from taking both of those perspectives. In the tradition, I shouldn't say traditional. When I say traditional, I mean the Eurocentric version. Let me try to use that expression. Those of you who have taken an, an, a basic astronomy course in university probably went through, as I did, the Eurocentric history of it. You start with the, the ancient Greeks and Ptolemaic universe, not through Copernicus and Newton and so on, th through the development of modern mathematical physics. And uh, only uh, occasionally did we find there was lip service paid to the, the far-flung cultural references that uh, two-eyed seeing incorporates. Um, but one of the early statements that came from Galileo, who noted that mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. And indeed, it is amazingly true that mathematics underlies essentially all of modern physics and astrophysics. This may surprise some of you because um, a lot of people get the impression that astronomers are looking at pictures. We take a photograph of a remote galaxy and try and interpret it from the sort of the morphology of the galaxy 
its appearance on the sky and so on. Um, and indeed, there are elements. You can learn some things from simple morphological discussions like that. But in fact, physics, the, the, the physics of the stars, the component stars and so on, as we'll see in a moment, um, that really relies on deep mathematical understandings. And that's a point that I think uh, I'll be making again uh, subsequently. The next slide <coughs> dates from 1960, and this it comes from a famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, Eugene Wigner, who wrote an essay, quite an extensive one, in which he made the, the remarks you see here. And I'll just focus on the, uh, uh, the first sentence more than anything. He, he says, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Mathematics seems to underpin our very nature, the, our understanding of the nature of the physical universe in a way that is astonishingly detailed. And uh, this, Wigner pointed out that this is quite remarkable. He does go on to say, though, if you note at the bottom, he said, we should be grateful for that. And, uh, but we should be uh, a little bit surprised at the end. We would be baffled to discover that this could apply to wide branches of learning. For example, sociology or biology, uh, uh, human interactions and so on. How could we ever think of applying mathematics to that? But in the physical sciences and in astronomy as well, uh, which I include as a branch of physics, mathematics is indeed the underpinning of, of all of that. Now this is a diagram, or a picture rather, that some of you may, not, uh, may, may or may not recognize, but let me just explain what we're showing here. On the left-hand side is a CAT scan taken from a hospital showing the, the uh, internal organs, the, the lungs and so on, the chest cavity here, the head, the, the pelvis of a patient. And this is an ordinary CAT scan, computer-aided tomography here. Here's what we know as a PET scan, which is positron emission tomography. And you can see that there are two very distinct bright spots on here. And there is, these are regions of high metabolic rate. In other words, they're cancerous regions. Where cancer is growing uh, furiously here. And there are, the two are combined into, into a single. What is the PET scan? Well, a PET scan relies on what we know as a positron. Positrons are antimatter. These are particles of matter that are like electrons, but opposite in charge. And when they meet electrons, they annihilate, giving off gamma rays. So what's being done in this image here is that the patient has been given an infusion, a drink of a, of, contains a small amount of a radioactive tracer, which decays and gives off positrons. These positrons almost instantly meet an ordinary electron, part of the body structure, and annihilate and give off gamma rays. So what we're seeing is the fact that this tracer is preferentially absorbed by regions of high metabolic rate, and then the decays give rise to these gamma ray emissions and track where you have these regions, uh, these cancerous regions. So they rely on positrons. Positrons are antimatter. Who ever thought of antimatter? Well, that was actually predicted in uh, the 1930s by Dirac. And uh, Dirac derived the, the possibility, if you like, that there may be particles called positrons, antimatter, undreamt of before that, by solving a set of mathematical equations and noting that there was a second solution. In addition to electrons, one could, one could hypothesize there might be these oppositely charged particles called positrons. And so he suggested, in a sense, he said, it would be unlike nature not to take that opportunity. So he predicted the presence or the existence of these particles called positrons. And lo and behold, they were eventually discovered and are now used daily in hospitals everywhere. And this is just one of the uh, amazing sort of um, products of pure mathematical reasoning in the, uh, in the physical sciences. Quite astonishing. Maybe Over to you, Melanie. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted oh, uh, to. Sorry, I should say, unless somebody has a question at this stage. Yes, I do see one. I, th I think a microphone is coming to you. I'll, I'll just I'll repeat your question for the benefit of the live stream, but so you can go ahead and ask. Um, I just wanted to know what antimatter is. So the question is, what is antimatter? Antimatter is uh, <coughs> well, it's just 
if you like, it's, it's ordinary matter that is kind of the mirror image of, of regular matter, so that every particle has, has an antiparticle. So the electron has what is called the positron, and when the two meet, they annihilate and turn into pure radiant energy. And likewise, protons, uh, uh, neutrons, everything has an, an antiparticle. We don't have it around us in large abundance, because if it were present in large abundance, the particles would be meeting and colliding and, and annihilating, producing just a bath of gamma radiation. But it is interesting to note that, for example, uh, a typical banana contains potassium in it, as you may know, from, t for dietary reasons. People eat bananas to get potassium. Um, and there's a small fraction of potassium that is radioactively unstable, one of the isotopes. And in a typical banana, you will have a radioactive decay of that sort, producing a positron about once every hour. And that positron almost immediately, just as in the PET scan, meets an electron and decays, so your banana sitting on the shelf is giving off gamma rays about once an hour. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question at the back. That's a very deep question, and it has to do... Uh, may <laughs> yeah. I ask it for the benefit of those online, please? Um, again, your question. Oh. Why is there a preference in the universe for matter over antimatter? There is, and the question is why, and that's a deep question of the of sort of cosmological origin and so on. So that's a question for cosmologists they have to address. There must have been, at the early stage of the universe, there must have been something that tipped the balance very slightly in the, se in the sense of an excess of ordinary matter. And that is a very deep question, and it's a good one to ask, but not something we can address right here. <laughs> so, back to Melanie then. Yeah, if we could address it, we'd get a Nobel Prize. It's <laughs> um, <laughs> so a good right. question. Um, all right, so throughout this lecture, we've kind of designed different topics that we're going to address through this two-eyed seeing. Um, mechanism of, you know, having indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge and having those two perspectives. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about the Haudenosaunee um, creation story, which has the Ohanu Gariwadegwa in it. So I really wanted to thank um, Jan for going through that earlier, um, because that is one of the instructions that comes out of Haudenosaunee creation, where it comes before anything important. So that's, you may have heard her say these words, and that's what she was referring to. So it's very important to start any uh, meeting, any lecture, any important thing that you're going to say with Thanksgiving. And so I'll get to where that comes from, um, but that's part of this creation. So there's kind of two elements I want to touch on. One of them is where do we come from? which is, of course, a very deep question that I think all cultures try to answer in a number of different ways. And then the other is this uh, set of instructions which was given to Haudenosaunee people, which is the Ohandu Gariwadekwa. So when we're talking about Haudenosaunee creation, you can see here on the left-hand side, I've got, um, I've got kind of two perspectives, so I'll move this way. But you can see I have a... Uh, um, above view of what's going on in the creation story. And then from the horizon, here's another painting. And this painting on the left is actually from the 1930s by a Seneca artist. Um, so in Haudenosaunee creation, there's a couple of different things that uh, I want to point out. Again, this is a story that can take several days to talk about. There are people who have written theses about Haudenosaunee creation and the different stories and versions and meanings attributed to this. So I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest of what I've learned. Um, and you can see here, um, you have a sky world at the top. So sky world is really the realm where everyone came from. And then you have a water world kind of in between. And then below that, there's actually an underworld. So there are kind of these three elements that we have to consider. And in the sky world up here, you can see there are these longhouses. So Haudenosaunee are people of the longhouse. And it's said that um, in creation, in sky world, there were longhouses. 
um, as well in Sky World. And you can see that there's this tree that has fallen. So in the creation story, there's this tree known as the tree of life or the celestial tree of life. And it emits light um, in Sky World and represents the cyclical nature of life, regeneration of life. Um, and this tree is actually slowly dying. It's actually dimming um, in terms of the light that it's letting off. So you can see right next to the tree, there's actually someone guarding it. Um, and this is said to be a chief in some versions of the story or an older man. Um, and he's there to protect the tree of life from, uh, I guess, from death. Um, so he's there to protect the tree. And then it's said that there's another woman in another village or another longhouse who's going through a period of grief, actually. So she's going through a period of trouble. And he's also troubled by the health of this tree declining. And so they come together and they meet. And when they meet, um, it's kind of a marriage between them that occurs. And she ends up becoming pregnant. So you might actually know the name of this woman. Um, and it's Sky Woman. And that's because um, Sky Woman fell from the Sky World. So the way that that happens is, there are a few versions again, but the tree of life either uh, falls over or it gets pulled out by the roots, and it causes a hole to form in the sky, um, and Sky Woman falls through this hole. And again, a couple of different versions of this, but in some, she is destined to regenerate life because she's pregnant, so she's going to fall to the world below and kind of regenerate life that way. Or she gets pushed in some versions as well. But either way, Sky Woman falls through this hole and she grabs onto the roots of um, the tree and kind of like at the edge of the hole, grabs the seeds of life as she falls. And you can see here, um, this is her falling. And here's her again. And as she's falling towards this water world below, there are a group of animals that already exist. So the water animals are already there in the version that I've heard, um, including the turtle, some beavers, muskrats, um, as well as water birds, such as the Canada goose that you can see here. So they all congregate and they see this creature who they've never seen before falling from the sky and they decide how to catch her and how to help her. And the decision comes that they're going to send their largest birds to break her fall. So that's why you see these geese um, breaking her fall, basically bringing her down to the water world. And they decide they're going to place her on top of the turtle's back. So when they do so, um, you may have seen this before, but in this depiction, you can see that the turtle's back looks a lot like the North Americas when you zoom out. Um, so that's an interesting aspect of, you know, if you have an aerial view, it really does look like a turtle. Um, and so as she's falling through the sky, they place her on the turtle's back. And it's said that a bunch of the other smaller water animals tried to go and grab some clay from um, underwater. And the one that succeeds is the muskrat. So when the muskrat grabs the clay, um, they place it on the turtle's back. And it said that the clay expanded because it was wet. So it kind of went like this. And then Sky Woman saw that and decided she was going to spread the clay over the turtle's back. And that's where um, the land came from, essentially. And you might have also heard Turtle Island um, as a reference to the North Americas. So this is all kind of related. Interestingly enough, if you think about it even more, turtles have an inbuilt home. So they, you know, they already have a home on their back. So it's interesting that that's a part of this story, that that is the home of this woman. Um, and then she dances in a counterclockwise fashion to spread the clay. Um, and when she does so, she apparently she turns and then throws the seeds um, of life that she's holding into the clay. So she actually plants a bunch of seeds in that process. Um, and then it said there's many layers to this story, but she gives birth to a girl first. So the first, um, the first person born was a woman. And that's also important in Haudenosaunee culture as it's matrilineal. So um, a woman is born and then that woman is impregnated. And it's said that she's impregnated in a couple of different ways. But the result of that is that she has twin boys. One of them is Sungwe the creator, and the other is Flint, 
Um, and Flint is kind of the chaotic version of the creator. They're twins. Um, so there, there comes this struggle of the creator who makes all that is good um, and Flint who makes things that are not so great, like mosquitoes or ice, <laughs> the snow, things that kill life. Um, and it, it turns out that the creator um, is more powerful than Flint, ultimately. And so Sungwai Adisu, the creator, uh, ends up making the first man and woman after that. Um, and when, you know, when humans are made, essentially, they're made last, which is interesting. Um, and they're also given this instruction of the Ohandu Gariwadekwa, which is, uh, it's kind of loosely translated as the Thanksgiving address or opening address, but really it does mean it comes before something important. So these are the words that you say um, and give thanks for the world around you. And it's interesting because the order that this occurs, um, as we heard earlier, is you know thanking the earth around you, your community, and then you move up to the sky. So you move up to the thunderers, you move up to the four beings, you move up to the stars, elder brother the sun, and grandmother moon. And so the order in which we, um, we give thanks to things really ties us back to the sky world eventually. Um, so this is just something I wanted to illustrate. Um, but before we move to Dave, are there any questions about Haudenosaunee creation? I see two. Uh, mm -hmm. Why are they moved clockwise? Why are they move? So they move counterclockwise. Oh, sorry, counter I actually don't know. Um, I wish I had the answer because I've I've gotten in trouble for going the wrong way. Um, <laughs> I've honestly heard anecdotally that it's because Mohawks are stubborn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we go the other way. Um, but most, a lot of other indigenous nations in Canada go clockwise, so it's an interesting one. Um, I actually don't have the answer. Um, I was just wondering, uh, could you speak more to the significance of like the fertile religion just prior to Christianity? I'll just repeat it for the online stream as well. So the question is about the significance of the turtle living in its own shell and having its own home. Yeah, um, I think that really kind of touches on all I wanted to say, but the fact that the turtle carries its own home means that it's kind of the symbol of home, I think, in this story. I think that that's part of where that, that symbolism comes from. Um, and there's also turtle rattles that are shaken, which represent um, shaking of the earth and the heartbeat of the earth. So in ceremony, that's also something that's done. And I think really it's to recall that yeah, the, the turtle is, you know, our home. Turtle Island is our home. And so when you rattle, um, you rattle something made out of a turtle, basically, um, that represents rattling the earth. And so that represents the heartbeat of the earth and you're connecting to that. So there's, there's quite a bit of significance there. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. Are there any others before I move to Dave? I think there's one in the front. One right here. Oh, two in the front. Uh, Hi. So, thank you. Yeah. So, with the creation story, mm -hmm. is it such that the sky world to this day is Earth? I think that's the idea that the sky world um, has this connection to us as people. And that's something that I want to talk about a little bit more um, with some star stories after this. but. Um, that's just a teaser, but yes, <laughs> I think so. Uh, is that one more in the back? That's interesting. That makes a lot of sense because I have heard the clockwise motion, yeah, mimics the motion of the earth, but I've never heard the other aspect of it. So 
maybe just repeating that um, it's to mimic the motion of the sun so everyone in the audience hears, but that's one possibility for sure. Okay, I think um, we can move to Dave now. Okay, well, here's the, uh, the mathematical picture, as we understand it, <coughs> the, the Big Bang, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's the history of the universe in, in snapshot here, and uh, I'll just take a moment to, to explain what it shows. Um, what it's showing is, as you progress from left to right, there's the age of the universe across the bottom, in, uh, from essentially from the, the zero, the, the creation event, up to the current time, which is 13.8 billion years later. And uh, you can see that there's a tremendous evolution of the matter in the universe as time goes, the nature of the universe, the structures and so on as time goes on. Um, it's a little confusing because, for one thing, you see this envelope here, which sort of gives you the impression that the universe is expanding out um, but constrained, or rather, um, it's in a, a pre-existing manifold, so that the universe is, you can think of it like a bomb expanding into pre-existing space, and that's not the case at all. The universe could be, um, the evidence seems to be showing predominantly that the universe is infinite in extent, uh, but there were, um, there were early possibilities in early cosmological studies that the universe might be finite in extent, but finite in extent does not mean that it's sitting inside another bigger space. It would have been completely, so to speak, folded back on itself, and there is no outside. Every, the, the universe is finite, but, but, uh, uh, but not in a, a bigger space, so to speak. So don't be misled by this apparent envelope here. Everything that's happened, every aspect of the universe is reflected in all of this perhaps out to infinite distance, I mean literally infinite. In any event, you can see the time scale down here, you, can, you don't think you can read these numbers, but it starts at zero, which I'll get back to in a moment, and here it is, 10 to the minus 32 seconds, that is to say, um, 100 million trillionth of a, 100 million trillion trillionth, I can't do the arithmetic quickly enough, but it's some tiny, tiny fraction of time after the creation event. Here we are a microsecond after the creation event, a hundredth of a second, three minutes later, and this is a characteristically important time uh, for reasons that was um, <coughs> pointed out in a, a book some a uh, couple of decades ago by Steven Weinberg called The First Three Minutes. After the first three minutes, the universe uh, is very, very well understood, and now we can say on astrophysical arguments that we understand it a long way back still. And here we are in the modern universe. So as the Big Bang takes uh, the origin that takes place, then uh, fundamental particles are produced. Those fundamental, fundamental particles combine to form a certain fraction of some of the light elements. We get a certain amount of helium, a certain amount of lithium, and so on, forming in the early Big Bang. Uh, subsequently, gravity starts to dominate. You get ma matter drawing together to form stars within which other elements are formed, and so on, galaxies, the whole ensemble. In, and I won't pretend to, to do it any kind of detail here, but eventually we wind up in today's universe with the structures we see. There are some interesting features, of course, well, some interesting features, what a silly thing to say. <laughs> uh, there are some <laughs> relatively recent discoveries we have made that are really quite astonishing, one of which is that we now understand that there must have been an episode very early in the universe, I mean within those first trillionths of trillionths of seconds, that is known as inflation, in which the, the then universe would have expanded by some unbelievably large factor in, in uh, just the twinkling of an eye, just the tiniest fraction of time you can imagine. So it would have scaled up in a way that is just uh, almost impossible to, to visualize. Um, and that's distinct from the current expansion of the universe, which is very quiescent by comparison. So there was this inflationary episode, and I won't explain the motivation for that, but this seems um, we seem to be compelled by cosmological observations to accept that there was such an episode in the very early stages of the universe. Uh, since then, it's been in, in an expanding stage, um, but um, <coughs> we understood until fairly recently that the, the universe was dominated by what we see around us, the stars, the galaxies, the interstellar gas, and so on. The gravity of the universe was dominated by ordinary matter, and it's only in recent decades that we've come to realize that the there is actually 
more still out there in the form of dark matter, the sort of thing that Tony Noble and his people are trying to find through experiments at the Cerebri Observatory and so on. Dark matter is the dominant uh, species beyond the, um, the ordinary matter that we have, or so it was thought until about 15 years ago. Have I got the timing right on this, Tony? The, the, when we discovered that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating where you'd expect it to be slowing because of the mutual gravitation of all the material in the universe. That acceleration is as yet incompletely understood, but um, is uh, manifestly the case. And that we, is attributed to what we call dark energy. Unfortunately, the terminology dark matter and dark energy leads to some confusion. Um, I wish a different term had been used for it. But in any event, the dark energy um, is of a nature that may have been anticipated by Einstein himself a century or so ago, at least mathematically, although perhaps not with the current interpretation. So there are all of these features that we need to explore and understand. What is the dark energy that is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe? What does that imply for the future of the universe? Where is the dark matter that is around us? We know it's present because it has a strong gravitational influence on the way galaxies rotate and interact and so on. Uh, but we have not yet detected it. We don't know what it is. And going back to the origin, what was the zero? Well, we can't answer that question. As you get back, look back in time, to closer and closer to the creation event, you reach a regime where matter was much more densely packed, so you need to have, uh, and, and the density means, extremely high density means very strong gravitational fields, but it also means that the particles are all in extraordinary close conjunction. So you need a quantum theory that deals with these very small linear scales. And what we do not yet have is a theory of quantum gravity that can merge those two successfully. So we reach a point as we look back in time where we are powerless to say what happened in the first tiny, tiny, tiny fractions. Now there are those who believe that string theory may the, be the resolution to this. With string theory, perhaps we can come up with a theory of quantum gravity that will allow us to fully understand the universe right from day zero right up to the present and into the future. But as I say, it's all a very, very uh, complex mathematical scaffolding. And uh, I think probably I'll just stop at that point and, say, and see if anyone has a question on that. Okay. So this is, this is, if you like, the, uh, the astrophysical paradigm right now. Uh, that is the, the one-eyed seeing of the, the mathematical physicists. Question at the back. Yeah, um, so I don't know what you're doing with the astrophysicists. Yes. Do you mean dark energy or dark matter? Dark believe, energy. Uh, can I ask it for the benefit of the online audience, please? Um, what do you think the timeline is then for dark energy to be discovered within your lifetime or beyond? Uh, within my lifetime? <laughs> That's a little shorter than your, your lifetime, I think. But, um, <laughs> dark energy, we've only just started to grapple with, and there are, there are constraints you can put on. One question is, does the effect of dark energy change over time? If it doesn't change over time, then the acceleration of the expansion now means that will continue into the, into the indefinite future. And in the long run, essentially all other galaxies and so on will be fleeing from us and we will be left in a sort of, uh, until they're beyond the horizon. In other words, light from them will no longer reach us. We'll be left in what appears to be an enormous, essentially infinite void. We'll be in complete isolation. But if dark energy actually changes over time, then that may not be the future. And so there are investigations into exactly how does dark energy, dark energy behave with time? Do we have any hint that it's, it has a sort of a fixed uh, effect all the time or does it, does it itself evolve? I can't imagine, I mean, I'm not, I don't work in this area, so please forgive my lack of uh, uh, sort of dogmatism on this, but I, I personally can't imagine that'll be resolved in a matter of even a few decades. Uh, the dark matter, on the other hand, I'm very hopeful that we will make direct detections of the dark matter in the foreseeable future. Question here, I think. 
I can repeat it if I can hear it here. Oh, yes. Perfect. Uh, well, I don't work in astroparticle physics. I actually, I'm a big telescope user and I study remote galaxies and so on. Um, and uh, so I'm not in the same, that quadrant of the discipline, if you like. Um, it's only lately, I have to say, and I said this in my introduction, that I've started to think uh, more two-eyed myself, in my teaching in particular. So, uh, no, in terms of my own research, no, for, for the decades I've been doing my research, it's been very much the the one-eyed, the Eurocentric, the mathematical background. And to now, I'm like, I like to think I'm broadening my horizon now. Not in a way that'll be earth-shattering, I dare say. <laughs> Back to Melody, I think. Yeah, I actually had a question to ask you, too. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you wanted to expand on, because you mentioned how, you know, galaxies, we won't be able to see other galaxies one day because of dark energy. Yeah. So can you speak to the luck of now, as, uh, as observers of astronomy, how you actually can observe other galaxies, whereas if we were born a little bit later, um, we wouldn't have that luxury. You know, that's a, a, a very interesting question, and in fact raises a, a, a whole spectrum of questions, because one thing you might ask is why is it that we live in a universe that allows us to do the things we do? I mean, for this is a, a big discussion that under, comes under the general rubric of fine-tuning, if, for example, the, the strength of gravity were a little bit greater, gravity had a stronger force than it does now, then what would, what would happen? Well, that means that agglomerations of gas that form stars would come together more dramatically, they'd be under stronger pressure, it'd be hotter at the center, the stars would evolve and so on, and burn up so rapidly that there would be no time for planetary systems around them to harbor life that could persist the stars would be much too short-lived. So you wouldn't have planets on which we have people like us, for example, because they would never have time to evolve in propitious circumstances. On the other hand, if the force of gravity were much weaker, you wouldn't form any stars at all. So how is it that we live in a universe where the force of gravity is just right and the, the charge on the electron is just the right amount to give rise to the, the sort of metabolic, the chemical reactions that allow us to live and so on? Is that that we're, we're lucky? Is the universe fine-tuned for us? Is it unique? Is, it, is that a God-given gift to us, that there's one universe where these things are all fine-tuned for us? Or are there possible, possibly a multiplicity of universes with a great variety, maybe an infinity of universes with a great variety of these different admixtures, different sets of properties and so on? And if so, by it would, it's only natural that we would have to live in one that allows us to be here. It's just a selection effect. Um, that's another interesting question though. How about the timing? If we come back 50 trillion years from now, will there be life forms like us? And what will their view of the universe be? Will the physical conditions permit life to, to survive throughout that passage of time? There's some constraints. The, the sun is about 4.6 billion years old. The universe is about 13.8. So the sun is a relative newcomer. It, it came into existence with its planets and so on about two-thirds of the way in the life of the universe and the galaxies and so on. But we couldn't have been created very much earlier than that because it takes time for the heavy elements to be created within stars and then seed the universe out of which new planets and people like ourselves are formed. So there's, we ha have to be a little later on the scene than that. Uh, but the other, it, for all we know, it could be a happy coincidence. But that's a very, very deep subject, actually. And there are books written about it, uh, one of which I actually brought along here. So I, but uh, I, it, this is a book by Max Tegmark called Our Mathematical Universe, My Quest for the Ultimate Nature of Reality. And in here he talks about this issue of the potential multiplicity of universes. Fascinating reading, very deep, very complex. But it, it, there may be arguments that suggest that there are literally an infinite number of universes, of which we are just one. Staggering as that sounds. Back to you, Melanie. <laughs> yeah, thank you for expanding on that. Um, 
So our next topic that we wanted to cover, as I mentioned, are stars and star stories. So I'll be speaking a little bit to um, Haudenosaunee star stories and also how I learned um, from my mentor, Sasha Dockstader, specifically. Um, so one of the really interesting things that brought me to learning more about Haudenosaunee astronomy is the Ganyangeha language. So you can see here just a couple of examples of words and how those words are related. And one of the things that brought me to this slide really is Sasha's teachings of the Oneida language. So another one of the Six Nations, but she taught, um, she was fluent in Oneida and she taught us that there was a similarity between the language for star and the language for a person's essence or their spirit or their soul, um, however you may want to call it. Um, and so based on those findings, I decided to look at the Ganyangeha root for star um, and then compare that to you know, what we know for the word for family. Um, and you can see here there's kind of this nice similarity. So we have Ojisokwa, which is stars. Then we have Ojisto, which is one star. And then you can see here we have Ojire, which means um, spark or fire. And then when you move that last part, that jile, to here, you see there's words for family. So gawajile means family or fire, and akwajile means my family. Um, so in the Ganyangeha language, it really looks like when you're talking about the word for star and you're talking about the word for family or fire, you're talking about stoking your fire. Um, and that really has to do with your ancestors and where you come from. So I thought that this was a really powerful connection between, you know, lingu linguistically, sorry, um, between words, and it really resonated with me that we are tied to the sky world. So that goes back to that question of, you know, is the sky world a current concept? And I would say, yes, it is. Um, and so here's an example of that connection. Um, another um, connection that I wanted to talk about a little bit more today you may know as the Pleiades, which is an open uh, star cluster. Um, the Pleiades is the Greek um, term. And here you can see the Ganyangeha word uh, or words, which is Jada Nihari Tehari Nunyakwa. And Jada stand, stands for seven, um, and the rest stands for dancers, but I don't know the roots. Um, so the seven dancers is the story of, um, of the Pleiades, essentially. And so in this story, um, it goes that there are this group of boys um, who are kind of camping out near a lake, a very beautiful lake in the story, um, and they're determined to have a ceremony and dance. And this is also another powerful connection, I think, for this evening um, when we're talking about indigenous dancers um, and we're talking about the seven dancers. So in this story, they want to dance, um, and so they want to throw a ceremony, and their parents won't give them any food because they think it's a waste. Um, so the children decide to dance anyway, and as they do so, they become so light that their feet leave the ground, and they actually dance themselves up <laughs> into the sky. So they dance so hard that they end up being stars um, in the story. And so um, these seven dancers are watching over the community, and they're, they're used in different ways. So another thing that's important to recognize is Oftentimes, when we talk about Haudenosaunee creation and references to the sky world, um, it's attributed to the location in the sky of the Pleiades. So when people talk about where do we come from, they actually are referring to a place either beyond the Pleiades or near the Pleiades, and that's often um, stated in Haudenosaunee astronomy. Um, and then also, the Pleiades is used as a marker for the first um, ceremony of the year, which is kind of like the Haudenosaunee New Year, called Midwinters, um, typically sometime between mid-January to early February. Um, and they, in order to come up with the date for the Haudenosaunee New Year or Midwinter, they do look at the location of, um, of the Pleiades in the sky. And that's how they determine when those dates um, are every year. So I don't want to talk too much about the ceremony, um, but it is about renewal, which is another thing that is important when we're talking about stars and stellar life cycles. Um, I'll, eventually, I'll throw that more to Dave, but I do want to just kind of make that tie right now in your head. 
Um, and so that's, that's one aspect of this that I wanted to mention, um, one star story. Um, another is Okwarigoa, which you may have heard of before or seen as the asterism, which is the Big Dipper. Um, it's a piece of Ursa Major in the Greek constellation names. But Okwarigoa actually stands for bear, or the greatest bear of all the bears of all the bears in Mohawk. Um, so the Goa can be used in that way, where if you're actually trying to describe um, the biggest or greatest of all things, you add Goa to the end. So you might hear people say, Nyawa Goa, which is like, great thanks, it's a lot of thanks, whereas Nyawa is just, thank you. Um, so Okwari Goa is about the greatest bear because it's a bear in the sky. Um, and you can see here what this story looks like over the course of an evening at a very specific place on Earth, which is Haudenosaunee territory. So the reason why this is a really interesting story is because um, at a certain time of year in the fall, you'll see this first panel um, right at twilight. So Okwari Goa, or the Big Dipper, will appear right on the horizon when you're at a very specific latitude, which is very close to Six Nations territory today, um, or it's actually the same because um, a lot of the nations moved from Upper New York State, which we also heard earlier. And that latitude, that north-south um, placement, is actually quite close together. So this story holds true in you know, older times for Haudenosaunee territory and also newer times for Haudenosaunee territory. It's the same story. So in the fall, you'll see it appear at this horizon level. Um, and in the story, the Okwari, or the Okwari Goa, is running across the horizon. And it's running kind of up what appears to be a slant. So in the story, there are hunters chasing this bear. Um, and there are actually four hunters. And one of them is lazy in the story. Um, so he falls and he pretends to twist his ankle and says, I can't do it. <laughs> can't chase the bear. Can you please carry me to the other three? And so they pick him up and they continue to run after this bear and they go up what appears to be a hill or a mountain. Um, and eventually what happens is the lazy hunter gets put down and he shoots the bear. So right here, right about at dawn, you'll see the okwari or the bear flip upside down in the sky and that represents when the bear is killed by the lazy hunter. And the, the reason that this is significant is because it's tied to Haudenosaunee bear hunting season. So it's often said, oh, you know, the lazy hunter has caught the bear, now it's time to hunt bear. Um, and in the story, when Okwari Goa is killed, um, they cook the bear over a fire. And so the, um, the grease and the fat and the blood stain the fall leaves. Uh, the colors that you see, the red, the orange, the yellow, and they stain the maple uh, tree leaves. So again, that's a tree that's place-based. It's originally from Haudenosaunee territory um, in southern Ontario. That's where that tree is indigenous to. So you have all these connections between, you know, um, cultural aspects like hunting the sky, you have the story aspect, um, and then you also have um, Sorry, I forgot what I was going with the last part, but <laughs> there are a lot of pieces that are connected to this story, um, which are land-based and place-based. So I wanted to just make that connection for you today. And that's what I have for Haudenosaunee star stories, but are there any questions about any of that? Oh, I think okay. there's one at the back. Oh, we have one there, yes. Yes, there definitely are. Um, there are a couple of indigenous astronomers in Canada that have actually worked on star maps. One of them is Dr. Annette Lee, who I believe is Dakota and Lakota. Um, so she has developed star maps with different constellations and star stories. And then there's Wilfred Buck, 
um, who was invited actually to speak here, but um, he's a Cree elder and indigenous astronomer, the first person that I saw, I think, in the news talking about this kind of stuff about 10 years ago, if I remember properly. Um, so he has also worked on star maps that have been developed. In terms of Haudenosaunee star maps, um, not that I've seen. These are the two stories that I know. Um, but I think that this is an area that is continuously being developed. I know, I believe it was at the National Gallery where those star maps, um, the National Gallery in Ottawa, they had an exhibit with the star maps. I'm not sure if it's still there, but I do know you can look up those names, Annette Lee and Wilfred Buck, um, and they often give uh, presentations about their versions, their constellations for those communities. So that's definitely somewhere for you to start. Yeah. Some of Wilfred Buck's are, are online, actually, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's an indigenous bookstore, too, I believe, if people are interested. Are there any other questions about that? One over uh, here. I, I will just add, um, the those constellations that Annette Lee and Wilfred Buck have developed uh, have actually been added to a, a stargazing app called Stellarium. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stellarium is very cool. It's an augmented reality app. So you can actually, you know, look up at the sky and then select different star cultures. And there's actually a, a number of different star, star cultures with constellations in the app that you can see. Uh, and, and those are a few of them. Yeah, and Stellarium's free. Um, it's something that I used as well in, in the course that I taught for Indigenous Astronomy, and you can, um, you can put in the stories and constellations for different cultures, so it's awesome that, that they're in there. I didn't know that. And you can download it and play around with it at home if you have time. Yeah, of course, it's worth noting that there's, there are interests like this all around the world. I lived for some years in Australia, Mark said in his introduction, and there's uh, uh, ethno uh, astronomy studies going on there uh, in, in uh, New Zealand and in the Mayan communities. All, all around the world, you'll find resources of this sort. Tonight, we're talking specifically about, uh, about the, those local to this area, but mm -hmm. you'll find resources like that really all around the world. It's a, a burgeoning field, there's no question. Yeah, definitely indigenous Australian resources and Maori resources um, in New Zealand. There's a lot of those that you can also look at. Um, at some point, I think we had looked up a podcast about Mauna Kea as well, so the indigenous Hawaiian people um, and their perspective about telescopes in Hawaii. Um, so that's also another great resource I would recommend. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of places to look, but I think especially for some reason in Australia and New Zealand, there's a lot that's been um, produced and published in this area. And I'd say it's more, it's we're catching up in Canada. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and so this, as I said, this is the sort of the, uh, for me, this is the, the ultimate part of the talk, uh, just to bring us to, to, I think, a fascinating closing point, and that is, you may have heard the remark, we are stardust. By the way, the, uh, the first time I encountered that particular expression, you hear it a lot these days, but Joni Mitchell used that in her song, um, uh, um, Woodstock. She said, We're, we are stardust as we go to the farm to, to, for the Woodstock Festival. I have no idea what Joni Mitchell meant by that. I doubt if she meant it in an astrophysical sense, but it's certainly true. But now it's a, it's a commonplace in, in astronomical teaching to use this expression because it reflects the fact that the atoms in our body, by and large, were made in stars. Uh, essentially, everything you see around you was a one time in a star, or in a set of different stars, not necessarily all the same one, of course. The hydrogen and helium, the very lightest elements in the universe, were created in the first seconds of the Big Bang itself. Um, but, uh, and then helium, a little bit, is created within stars and subsequent nuclear reactions and so on but the heavier elements were all created in stars in ways that we fully understand. So if you think about your, your body, your body, incredibly, I didn't realize this until lately, your body is 65% by mass oxygen. You are made mostly of oxygen, which I hadn't realized. I would have thought, for example, that you've got bones that contain calcium and so on, 
but those are hydroxyapatites that have a lot of oxygen in them as well and so on. So 65% of your body by weight is oxygen, another 18.5% carbon and hydrogen, of course, because it's in the carbohydrates and so on, nitrogen. You see the different elements here, 1.5% calcium, mostly in the bones, and uh, trace elements of other things. But these elements were made in stars. So you were, the atoms in your body, you were the iron and the hemoglobin in your blood and so on was somewhere at one time in a star somewhere, which I think is just, to me, I think the most well-known. One of the two. I find the, in astronomy and astrophysics, the two things that strike me as the most powerful of all were, first of all, the fact that we live in an expanding universe so we can understand its, its past history, its origin, and the evolution it's gone through to reach the stage we're at now. But the second, that we were in stars somewhere, it just, just staggers me. Um, next slide, if I could. Yeah, and here's what, uh, what we know about the cosmic abundance of the elements in the universe um, and where they come from. This is a diagram that we use in our teaching very often. And there's what we call a logarithmic scale here. And the easiest way to think about that is just to think about the relative numbers. So, for example, down here, there's how much lithium there is in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the cosmos, just sort of distributed everywhere, and there's how much hydrogen there is. And you can see there's about uh, 100 billion times as many hydrogen atoms as there are lithium atoms. So this is a, a very, very dramatic scale here. But what you notice is that as you go from the light elements towards the heavier elements, this is uranium and so on over here, there's iron here, uh, there's oxygen and carbon here, as you go from the light elements to the heavy elements, the numbers are going down essentially all the time. And uh, this, uh, but we understand how this happens. We understand all the intricate details that give rise to this. We can even explain, for example, notice this very pronounced zigzag effect. The odd numbered, the atoms that have an, an even number of protons, like oxygen and carbon, are more abundant than those that have an odd number of protons, like nitrogen. And we understand why that is so in terms of the nuclear reactions that happen within stars. The nuclear fuel being consumed, converted into heavier elements, releasing energy and so on. All of these are well understood. Um, the, you notice that there's a peak here at iron. The lighter stars, the less massive stars like the sun and so on can use fuel up to iron and so on. The most, the most massive stars will eventually... Con for, sorry, let me just step back a moment. In the sun, what you're doing is hydrogen is being fused to form helium, and that releases energy. When the hydrogen is all used up, some billions of years from now, those fires will go out, but helium will start to fuse to form carbon and release yet a bit more energy, giving the sun a bit more longevity. But a star like the sun will not get very much beyond that point. It will die a quiet death in what's known as a white dwarf, and we don't produce much in the way of heavy elements. Stars that are more massive, though, produce progressively heavier and heavier elements until they reach what is known as the iron peak here. Once a star has gone through this rep, uh, in increasingly rapid cycle of using heavier and heavier elements, and they reach the stage where they're forming iron at the core, that's the end of it. That's the end of the nuclear fuel. No f uh, further fusion reactions will give you the energy required to keep the star up, to hold it up against gravity, and the star is doomed. So iron is sort of a natural end point for stars of that ilk. The question is then, where did these heavier elements come from? And the answer is they're produced by catastrophic events like supernova explosions, by massive stars that have reached this point. Gravity dominates. No more nuclear reactions can take place to hold the star up, so it catastrophically implodes, and then parts of it rebound and blast material out into the depths of interstellar space, producing heavier elements as they go because of complex reactions that happen there, neutron capture events and all sorts of things. And we understand in intricate detail all of the steps in this process. So the next slide, I think, I mean, that's, that's too detailed, but this is a picture of the sort of thing that happens. This is what I meant earlier. I said I would come back to this point. A lot of people think astronomers look at a picture like that and they try to understand what's going on. Look at that photograph and what does this tell you? We don't just look at this photograph. What we do is we analyze the light from these different tendrils. We study the spectrum of the light. We understand the physics of the, the atoms, the electrons, and so on that are present. 
and we understand their temperature, their motions, their abundances, their interactions, their origin and so on, all of that is part of the, the subject of astrophysics. This is an event or an object known as the Crab Nebula, which is in the constellation Taurus, and this is the remnant of a star that exploded catastrophically in 1054 AD, or rather it exploded some hundreds of years before that. We saw it here on Earth in 1054 AD because it took the, the light several centuries to reach us from its moderate distance. Um, and it was seen, for example, by the ancient Chinese. There's an example of how ethnoastronomy helps. It wasn't recorded in Europe in the, in the sort of dark ages, or, or, sorry, the, uh, the dark ages when there were very little in the way of scientific records being kept, but the Chinese and Korean court astronomers recorded this event in 1054 AD, a star that was bright enough to be seen in the daytime sky for months. And this is it. This is what's left now. It is possible, I do have my students do this in a, in a, a lab exercise. You can take photographs that were taken, separated by a few decades, and see that the, the shell of gas is actually still expanding. There was a catastrophic eruption that blasted material out into space at speeds of thousands of kilometers a second. And over the space of decades, you can see that it's still expanding. You can invert that in your mathematically and ask when did the, the explosion take place? And the answer is a thousand or so years ago. This is the remnant of that event. And at the core of this object down there is a star which is a, a rapidly rotating neutron star, a pulsar, which is the collapsed core of that death of that massive star. So we understand all of those things, and it's in these little tendrils of material that heavy elements that were produced during the life of the star and then the catastrophic explosion are being cast out into space where they will subsequently accumulate in gas clouds and form new solar systems, new planets, new people. So that's what we mean when we say we are stardust, and that's where it comes from. Over to you, Melanie. I think we had one more quote. Um, so maybe we can just leave this up, but I think it really speaks to Dave's point, um, just that you know there's this cycle of uh, renewal in the sky. So you have these collapsing, you know, gigantic stars that end up um, collapsing off of an interior and exploding outwards, and then having that material with the heavy elements that we're made of um, that get distributed outwards, and then new stars form and planets form and people form. So this quote really just speaks to that. Um, and I wanted to just end off on this one last point, which I thought was a really beautiful teaching that I've come across, um, which is about the Yohare Yoji Stokwale, which is the starry path. So you'll see, again, it has that word Ojistokwa, which is stars. So it's really talking about a path of stars. And this is our perception of the Milky Way from you know, oftentimes from a dark sky in this area, you'll see something like this. Um, and again, the Milky Way is our galaxy, and you can see on the kind of the brighter part in the center, this is us looking into the center of the Milky Way. And then you have this, um, one of the arms of the Milky Way that we're actually looking into. So when we talk about the Yohade Yorisokwale, we're talking about a path of what's known as um, campfires. So when you have these stars along this path, it's representative of the campfires where your ancestors sit. Um, so really, the stars are your relatives. Again, you're thinking about stars as family. Stars are where you come from. And when we talk about Haudenosaunee um, kind of life and death, it is said that when babies are born, they travel down this, this starry path um, between seven and 10 days before they're born. And that's where their essence comes from. And um, that's how they're born into the world. And when someone passes away on the 10th day after they pass away, they actually travel back up this Milky Way and go back to the sky world. Um, and along the way, again, they convene with their ancestors and they sit at the campfires of their family. And they're there together with, um, with the people who, you know, who they came from. So I think this is a really beautiful way of just understanding that we do come from the stars. There are a lot of different teachings as to how we understand that. And we can think of these things as um, really humbling aspects of being a person. And there are different 
you know, different interpretations to that, but we really wanted to touch on that at the end. Um, so I think we'll just leave it there. But Nyaw Goa, thank you again for listening to us today. Um, and I guess we'll take some more questions if there are any. Thank you, Valley. <laughs> <laughs>